Hello, hello everyone. I hope you're extremely well. I'm Igor from Milan and I work at Spin Me Up. And today we are here with Pietri Rielingeis, and he's the founder of uh, Arena Capital, and he's a, a real trading expert, and, and he really knows his way around researching stocks and, and drawing charts and, and all of that. And he's got quite a good track record. So we actually going to do a two-part series with him. This is the first part that you are hearing now. And in this first episode, we'll be covering how to research a company, because I know that that's a, a question a lot of in, new investors ask. So how do I research a company? How do I know if a company is a good buy or a good sell or anything like that? And in the second part, we're going to look at just the Chinese tech businesses. So that involves process, it involves Tencent, so process, uh, Alibaba, all of that. So thank you for that. Then we'll also look at some of the Bitcoin charts what's going on in that, and then finally we'll look at some of the oil charts and how that affects us, so stay tuned for that. So, Pedro, it's awesome to have you here. Um, so tell us tell us more, how do I research a company? How do I know whether a company is a good long-term investment or short-term investment? How do I know when I should buy or sell all of that? All right, so first of all, uh, I will start to thank you for having me. Um, it's really cool to see what you guys are doing. Uh, pushing financial education is definitely uh, something that's close to my heart. So thank you very much for the opportunity to speak to your, um, what do they call them, viewers, listeners, I don't know, students. Um, but thank you for, for the opportunity. So yeah, so where do you start with the company is a, is a relatively good question, right? People, um, and this is a trend I think that's been growing over the last couple of years, in part thanks to easy equities, making um, you know investments a lot more accessible to people. Uh, so there's a whole bunch of new guys that are entering into the market, guys and girls, uh, entering into the market, you know, wondering where do I begin? Um, and what a lot of people do in the beginning is sort of just buy the companies that they know. So an interesting, uh, I guess, side note, if you will, uh, they put a bunch of, I think they were seven years old, a bunch of seven-year-old kids. And this was, I mean, this was years ago, maybe 10 or 20 years ago uh, that I remember um, or at least that this study was done. But they put a bunch of uh, seven-year-olds versus a bunch of professional fund managers, and they said to them all, you know, pick stocks. Um, and 10 years later, the seven-year-olds outperformed the professionals, right? Because they picked stocks that they knew. They liked Lego, and they liked McDonald's, and they liked brands that they used every single day. Uh, and then obviously the professionals had all of these quant models and all these various investment cases, why they should be invested in this and that. And the kid who picked Coca-Cola, you know, ended up doing really well, right? So, um, so how do you pick companies? I mean, you can't just pick the ones that you know and the ones that you use because it's not necessarily, um, you know, it's, it's not a guarantee that it's going to be a good investment. So the primary sort of idea is that you want to get to know uh, the business that you're investing in, right? So I think it was Warren Buffett. Uh, I'm not sure. Um, but basically, the advice is like if you if you had enough money to buy the whole business, would you do it? And if if the answer is no, um, I would rather buy a different business. Then why are you even buying any shares in that business at all, right? Because uh, one of the things that that comes with being a shareholder in a company is you are a part owner of that business, right? So you have to um, sort of consider it as, well, is this a good place for me to put my money? Do I think that this company is going to do well? So there's a couple of sort of things that I go through, right? Um, obviously, macro research is very important um, for me, at least, where I try to identify sort of major themes in the market. Uh, so you kind of take a look back and just take a step back and you say, well, given the current circumstance, what is going to do well in the next couple of years? What business is going to survive for the next couple of years, right? Um, for example, ShopRite, you know, yeah, okay, they've got a few issues here and there in Africa and they're making deals and this and that and whatever, but ShopRite's been around forever. And if I think about 50 years from now, is ShopRite still going to be around? Very likely, yes, right? Uh, is Zoom still going to be around in 50 years? Mm, I'm not sure. Is Google going to be around? Very likely, yes. Right. So that sort of longevity in um, in a company is the first thing that you sort of want to consider. Right. 
Uh, thereafter, there are sort of major themes that play out in the market. So obviously, the coronavirus has been a big theme, um, as well as now, more recently, the vaccine rollout on a global level, uh, balancing the vaccine rollout with the threat of additional lockdowns. And then you can start seeing, well, uh, you know, there's two sort of schools of thought here. One, there's the lockdown trade, which is all your companies that have made a huge amount of money off of, you know, people staying at home playing video games, for example, or using uh, tools like Zoom or Microsoft Teams or whatever it is, um, online shopping, all those things that really benefit from people not being able to leave their home has done really well. Then there's the school of thought of, you know, and, and in a situation where we lock down again on a global scale, which is somewhat likely, right? Those stocks who could potentially do well again, right? Uh, or continue to grow earnings at least. Um, then there's the other side of the coin, which is this like coming out of lockdown trade, right? So what happens when we come out of lockdown? Everybody starts driving again. The demand for energy goes up, uh, you know, restaurants, booze, cigarettes, those types of things like there's a lot of, well, obviously there's lots of different things, you know, movie theaters and uh, sports parks and all those types of stuff. Whereas life goes back to normal, who stands to benefit? Well, obviously the companies, uh, you know, put potentially online retailers suffer a little bit or, you know, give back some of the gains that they made, but physical retailers like department stores and property companies that earn a percentage of revenue that department stores that are tenants of theirs uh, you know, as as part of the rental agreement, those companies are going to do really well as people sort of go back to normal, right? So one of the things that I try to do is try to identify some of this sort of more longer term themes. So something that can last for two to maybe five years as a potential driver behind the market. So once you've got that thesis in place, you can then start looking for companies in those sort of sectors or in those areas that you um, that you think is going to do well, right? So, for example, I'll, I'll run you through through something. So, for example, I think that energy is a very big theme over the next couple of years. We saw energy getting crushed uh, thanks to the COVID lockdowns. Um, but there's a couple of things that have been happening in that market. So, for, particularly in the oil production market, right? Firstly. Um, you know, there was a there was a huge increase in the number of guys that are doing natural gas and shale gas and fracking and all that kind of stuff uh, in the US, which put downward pressure on the oil price. Um, and as that started happening, more and more people or oh, oil rigs, traditional oil rigs, you know, ocean bound oil rigs shut down. Um, and then obviously, as that supply comes off of the market, um, these well, these shale gas wells, if you will, um, don't last very long. So they create a huge amount of, of natural gas in the beginning for the first year, and then they taper off very, very quickly, right? So a very short-term impact on long-term energy supply is what these shale gas things do. So firstly, there's a huge increase in those uh, in the US over a couple of years, which led to a reduction in oil wells. Because oil wasn't very attractive, um, no new investments took place into the construction of new oil wells. Now, if you think about one of these oil rigs that's sort of floating in the Gulf of Mexico or somewhere in the ocean, I mean, this is like a, it's like a skyscraper at sea. I mean, it takes five to seven years to build one of these things, right? And they're massive, massive, massive. So nobody's built one in the last five years. So, because there's been sort of no reason to, right? A lot of these shale wells are now starting to taper off their output as to be expected. So we're starting to reach a point where, wait a minute, there's actually not enough production going around here. And we're working on assumptions which potentially are flawed, but the assumption is that, you know, there's this infinite growth that the world economy goes through. Everything just always keeps growing. Everybody can always keep growing consumption. Everyone can always keep growing earnings. Um, and there's really no limit, right? So, which I'm not sure I don't think we've reached the upper limit. Obviously, I don't think we'll get there for probably another couple of hundred years or whatever. But at some point, you know, growth can't be infinite. We've only got one Earth. But anyway, um, so we have a situation where if you look sort of further into the future, you start seeing, well, wait a minute. If the world keeps developing the way that it is, um, demand for energy continues to go up. 
So something, for example, that's interesting to look at is demand for air conditioning. You know, almost 80 or 90 percent or 84 percent or something like that of households in, in the U.S. have air conditioning. Um, and that number is, I don't know, 12 percent in Africa. So I can guarantee you everybody wants air conditioning, right? So that demand for air conditioning drives demand for energy to power that air conditioning. So this and, and now if you look at, OK, we get economic growth and, you know, Africa is a growth story um, and sort of on a global level, um, people's economic circumstances are continuously improving. Um, and this has been the case. I mean, if you look at what it was in the, in the Middle Ages versus what it is now, how many more people as a percentage? Yes, there are more people. Uh, so from a pure numbers perspective, more people are in poverty now than ever in the world or ever in history. But from a percentage of total population perspective, less people are in poverty than ever before. Right. OK, COVID may have caused a little bit of a blip on that graph. Um, but if you think of the really long term sort of picture, things are really much better for people now than what they were before. So and that's this infinite growth sort of theorem, right? So we can assume that as the world continues to improve, um, there's going to be a continuous increase in demand for energy. So now you start looking, OK, well, what are the what are the sources of energy? Well, oil, right? Everybody's very everybody's hugely, um, you know, a big fan of, of solar and renewable and all that. But if you look at the total energy mix, um, the contribution that those make is really, really small. The good old black stuff, dinosaur juice, that's what the world runs on. And it's probably going to continue to run on that for some time. And yes, over time, that'll be phased out. But I mean, that's going to take a long, long time, right? So the quickest, easiest way to produce energy is to is to drill for oil. So in any case, so you, you start building this like this sort of theorem, this thesis, like, OK, well, as the world continues to increase and people's standard of living continue to increase, their energy consumption increases. I mean, think about your personal situation, how much energy you use compared to someone that lives in, you know, Ethiopia or Uganda or um, a really sort of like India, right, where, where there's huge amounts of poverty. So as the lives of the Indian people continue to improve, suddenly they get cell phones and now they need to charge them. So demand for energy starts to increase, right? Um, and you have the situation where over the last couple of years, we've been sort of very anti oil and all sorts of stuff. And, you know, come COVID, what happens is there's a global lockdown Oil contracts trade negative. You had to pay people to take your oil off your hands because, you know, suddenly the world pushes to extremes as well. Right. So suddenly everybody believes, well, you don't need uh, we're never going to need oil again, you know, because oh, everybody's locked down. And yeah, there's been a huge drop off in demand because nobody's flying around, nobody's driving around, everybody's staying at home. So oil demand drops very drastically, very quickly. And obviously the oil price drops very drastically, very quickly. And this results in more oil rigs and more shale gas operations all basically going out of business, right? Shutting down. So now we have even less demand, I mean, less supply than we had before. So what happens now when you know, it might take a while, but let's say in a year from now, everything is back to normal that it was before. Now we have the same or higher oil uh, energy demand as before, but less supply. OK, let's start building some oil rigs. That takes five to seven years. So there's this huge gap where there's an imbalance between how much energy is necessary and how much energy is being produced. And that is what a driver could be for the oil price for the next couple of years. OK, cool. So now we think, OK, energy, not necessarily just oil, but energy is a big theme for a three to five year view or a two to five year view. So how do we now start identifying companies that we can invest in on the back of that? And this is sort of the fun part, right? So, well, also the boring part, really. Um, so you have to sort of start looking at a, on a global level. Who are the oil producers? Um, what we sort of suggest to do for newer traders, um, particularly those who are very active, right, is to do like a bit of a project. So 
you look at a company, for example, okay, oil and gas producers. So you can start off by looking at ETFs, right? So there's some really good ETFs. Sorry if I look this way, it's just to, um, uh, it's just to open or just to look at a different screen. I just want to look at this stuff. So for example, um, the, uh, what is it called? SPDR select sector fund energy select sector, right? So it's like a spider fund is what it stands for or it's SPDR. Um, the ticker is XLE listed on the New York Stock Exchange. Inside there, that's like an energy select ETF, right? So you can go and look at the constituents of that, and that gives you a list of companies, for example. Um, you can look at the oil and gas exploration and production ETF. Uh, that, again, gives you a um, list of companies. Now, this is obviously in the in the sort of exploration and, and production stuff rather than the the uh, sort of larger producing and refining sort of sector. Um, but you can sort of, you know, you can cheat a little bit and look at some of the indices, oil and gas indices and, and that kind of stuff. And it gives you a list of companies. And they're in that, often they're in those indices because they're the biggest, right? And this gives you now a basis of where to start. So you can then, and it, I mean, it's quite a bit of work, but you then have to sort of draw up a spreadsheet for yourself and say, so, okay, cool, you know, let's look at Exxon Mobil. Um, where, where are their production facilities? Where do they produce? Where do they extract the oil? You know, let's, uh, I'm just going to make stuff up as I go here. So they've got some in Russia, they've got some in Brazil, they've got some in the US, or whatever the case. Um, in each area, what percentage of total production comes from that region? What currency is that earned in? How much of their total profit is produced by each area? How many, what risks are in these area? Do they have stuff in the uh, in the Middle East? Is there a risk of war? Is there not? If there is, how much impact is that going to have on their on their total earnings? Um, you know, what is their capex? What is their the EBITDA? You, you know, you can look at the, that ratio kind of stuff as well. It's also, you know, ratio analysis is relatively important to see how efficiently the company is running. And you build yourself a big spreadsheet and you compare the stuff, right? Uh, and it's often helpful to go past sort of uh, or go through three years worth of of earnings data. So you look at the financial reports over the last three years and you see if you can spot trends. Well, these guys are spending huge amounts in research and development. Why? And then you can go look at old press releases and statements and this and that and whatever and newspaper articles and all sorts of stuff that you can find. Oh, I see. These guys are spending all this money on R&D because what they're doing is they're actually laying... Uh, you know, they're building a network of electronic vehicle charging points all throughout Europe. Oh, that makes sense. Wait, did you tell it this is a this is an oil company? Why are they doing this? Oh, okay, no, I see. They're busy. They're busy investing in green projects. They don't want to be an oil producer. They want to be electricity producer. So they're building power stations. So you start finding that type of stuff by literally going through three years worth of financial data st statements and three years worth of annual reports. And then you dig into the stuff, right? And you, you sort of just research and read up as much as you can. For the more active traders, um, the guys who want to be in and out and in and out and trading all the time, you want to know things like, uh, what is the average daily volume? How many shares trades a day? Uh, what percentage of free float is available to trade? Um, just to define that, let's say the company has 100 shares issued, right? But the directors and the, and the founders sit with 50 of them, and only 50 shares are actually available to trade on the stock market. That's free float. So now what happens if one of the directors decides, well, I'm going to dump 25 shares into the market? You increase the free float by 25%, and you might crush the price, right? So these types of things, what, uh, what corporate actions are they busy with uh, are they doing share buybacks? Are they paying out special dividends? You want to get a feel for how the company is run. Primarily, you want to get a feel for what is the primary drivers of income for the business? Where are those drivers from? And how much is each driver a con contributing to the overall picture? And what risks are there for that? So if you take something like, like a, let's say a mining company, you know, what minerals are they mining? Where are they mining it? What happens if there's an earthquake and their copper mine gets shut down? Now, if you do that on enough companies, you start realizing, well, if there's an earthquake in Chile, these companies are going to be negatively affected. The copper price is going to go up, and those guys 
are going to are going to do well. And there's your opportunity to quickly, you know, buy some of those shares and sell these because of an earthquake that shut the mine down. And I think what's what's helpful is to have that sort of, you know, there's there's you start off sort of with a macro backdrop and say like, well, what are the big things that are going to be that are going to be driving um, markets over the next couple of years? And right now that is. You know, a couple of things, quantitative easing in the US, um, demand for energy, further continuous technological uh, innovation. Um, and, you know, in the in the shorter term, this like reflation trade, the world coming back alive again. Uh, so, for example, the Chinese, one of the Chinese ports reopened for business today. So that's going to be bullish, right? Because suddenly uh, a third of China's container shipments back online. So that's good for global trade, um, which is going to be good for commodities and all sorts of other stuff, right? So you kind of want to, um, it's like putting a puzzle together. So you kind of start with the really big pieces. And then from there, you look at the individual companies and you, and, you know, you can also spend a bit of time trying to get to know who the directors are and that kind of stuff. I'll be honest, I'm not, I'm not so much into that. I'm more into like the threats and opportunities type thing. So what are the major threats that these guys or, you know, to the business and what are the major opportunities that they're busy working on? Um, so, for example, uh, you know, a, a local company that was invested in food suddenly pivots to they're becoming a cannabis business. Really? <laughs> not something that I find convincing, not something that I'm willing to back because these guys have no history in cannabis. Now, suddenly they're the experts, you know, um, rather than try and find somebody who started off as a cannabis business as an example um so yeah i don't know it's uh i guess it's just a lot of reading right i think uh, as well so, so some of the points that i've learned uh what works and what doesn't work that well is first of all you have to understand the company so you know if you're able to explain it to uh, those seven-year-olds um then if you, if you explain it well, you understand it well. And when you understand something, you, you probably understand better whether it's a good or bad investment. And uh, second of all, if you can predict consumer behavior. Uh, so I think both consumer behavior, so other the customers of the specific business that you are looking at will, uh, you know, respond to whatever is going on in the world or in that situation or where they're at and, and future opportunity. And I think also actually predicting uh, investor behavior. So if you look at the uh, the Wall Street bets, what happened was it earlier this year or last year? Yeah, with GameStop and stuff. Yeah, yeah. So it's it's you know that hype. So if you can predict, you know these various types of things, I think it's the the investors that perform the best, or the investors that predict the future the best, and the consumer behavior the best. Well, I think that I think it's hard to predict the future. I'm not sure that you can do that. I think the madness of crowds is sometimes very. Um, sort of unpredictable, right? But I do agree with you. It's like, you know, there's a, there's a thing that says the contrarians are usually the ones that make the most money. But being a contrarian for the sake of being a contrarian is not actually being a contrarian at all, right? It's like, well, everybody thinks, everybody tells me Sassel is supposed to be 300 Rand a share. I'm not gonna buy Sassel because these guys are wrong. I'm gonna buy something else. You know, that's not being a contrarian. Thinking Sassel is worth 300 Rand a share based on your own analysis while the rest of the market says it's not, that's being a contrarian, right? So you have to do your own homework. Um, and you're right though, if you can catch those trends, sort of not necessarily when they start, but when they're still in their early stages, that's how you, that's how you make a lot of money, right? Um, and a lot of that is just sort of thinking about, well, what would the herd do? Like it's exactly sort of to your point. It's like if you can, if you can estimate or consider what people are going to do, how the customers of this business are going to react to, you know, a new product or whatever the case is, um, you can make a you can make a lot of money. So um, an example would be Moderna, right? Um, Moderna was under a huge amount of pressure, and suddenly um, everybody wants a vaccine, right? And these guys are printing money. So will that last forever? Probably not. Uh, in five years from now, are we going to see some lawsuits against them for adverse reactions? Probably yes. Um, is it going to be big enough to undo the huge amount of money that they're making now? 
Probably no. So is Moderna worth buying? Yeah, right? Um, if you look at something like, uh, uh, I don't know, what's another good example? Transaction capital, I love transaction capital. Um, you know, the thesis there is this, it's the African growth story. Okay, so I'll, I'll run you through this sort of process in my, in my head as well. Um, Africa has less cars per capita than almost any other uh, continent, right? Also, Africa is growing faster than almost any other continent. So naturally, as economic conditions improve and, um, you know, the, the lifestyle or standard of living for most people improve, what are they going to want to do? They're going to, obviously, they're going to get jobs. They're going to need to move around. They're maybe going to want to buy cars, right? Um, but in truth, we in Africa do things differently. So we might not want to buy cars. We might want to, um, you know, build bigger sort of public transport infrastructure, whatever the case is. Um, but in general, things are going to improve. People are going to get jobs. People are going to start companies. And not just South Africa. I'm talking about Africa in, in general, right? Um, obviously, transaction capital operates mostly in South Africa. But that African growth story is really one that I think is is a big a big driver in future, right? So, okay, what does transaction capital do? Well, they do two things. They do debt collection, so that's a good business. Fine, I guess, you know, everyone's always going to have bad debts that they need to pay and you need to send a, a debt collector after you. So if you've gotten an SMS that says, hey, you know, please pay your Edgar's account or whatever, odds are that's transaction capital doing the work, right? Um, and that's a good business. You can look at all sorts of stuff like re recovery ratios. You know, they buy one rand's worth of debt for like, seven cents and then they spend another five cents uh recovering and then you know they maybe they recover only 50 cents they're still making a huge profit kind of thing um but the exciting part of their business is the sa taxi business right that's the one that i think is really going to be a big owner so what what happens there the thesis is economic conditions improve um and not in the short term right i mean right now things in South Africa are looking a bit shady and we've got all sorts of issues with government and, and, and whatever else. But, you know, outside of a situation where South Africa is really melts down, um, which I think is relatively unlikely, I think it gets a bit shaky, but I do think that at some point, um, you know, the socio-political situation changes and things do improve, right? Um, so, Transaction capital basically sells taxis. So all these says for Kile taxis, the taxi minibus taxis with the South African flag on the side, that's all wavy. That's them, right? Um, I mean, they're selling almost 200 of these a month. So much so that the manufacturers are only willing to give them 80 or 90% of production because otherwise they would sell to nobody else, right? Um, not only do they sell them, they've got the entire supply chain not the entire supply chain but a lot of that supply chain so they finance them for you so they give you not vehicle finance but developmental finance so this allows them to charge higher interest rates right because they're not financing an asset purchase or a vehicle purchase they're financing a small business so they do a couple of interesting things they check do you have uh, um, an approved route Right. By are you a member of a taxi association? Yes. Do you have an approved route that you're allowed to drive? Yes. Okay. Cool. Then they can go and see how much we estimate this person or this taxi can make on this route. X amount because there's so many passengers. So they've been doing it for a long time, so they've got huge amounts of telematics. So they track all the taxis as well, right? So they can see. Okay, this route is very popular. So this guy can, on average, make this much. How much does a driver cost as a salary? How much does a, a insurance cost? How much does maintenance cost? Da, 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 da. Can this as a little business run profitably? If the answer is yes, they'll finance you, right? So now they sell you your taxi, they service your taxi. If you don't pay it, they they repossess it, refurbish it, and resell it. Um, plus they track your taxi. If your taxi is stationary for two or three days, they phone you and say, hey, your taxi hasn't moved. Do you need us to fix it? Is everything okay? Or hey, your taxi is heading towards the border. Like, are you aware of that? Did someone steal it? Um, so they provide a really, really great service to the people that use their, their product. Right. Um, and they have almost a lockstep, um, you know, growth with the rest of the country, with the rest of the country. 
if suddenly, you know, we create 10 million jobs, which we desperately need, all those people need to get to work. How do they get to work? Well, most people in South Africa and Africa make use of mass transport or public transport or taxis, right? So that is a, co a company that is almost like provided the wheels don't fall off of the southern part of the entire continent, they're going to keep growing and keep doing well. So that's something that you can then get behind. And then you can go look at, uh, you know, the balance sheet stuff and say like, okay, well, what is the credit loss ratio? What is the, um, you know, how many people are not paying their debts? How are they running in terms of, um, you know, what kind of margins are they making? Is Are they making um, profit, this, that, whatever? And you can then start digging into those things and start spotting trends like that. So one thing that stands out for me with them, for example, is they've got incredibly low credit loss ratio. So people don't generally default on their in their installments for their to, to pay for their taxis. The reason that that is is because they've got this telematic system that if your taxi is stationary, they phone you up and say, hey, is it is it broken? Do you need us to fix it for you? Oh, you know, actually it is broken. Oh, okay, cool, bring it in. You know, we'll fix it. You could pay off the 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 you know the repairs over time. Um, let's get this taxi driving again so that you can afford to pay your installments. So that's a good business, right? And something else that fits in with that uh, model is uh, Vivo Energy. So Vivo Energy owns, a, you know, 2,300 or 2,000, I don't know, probably more by now, but over 2,000 petrol stations all throughout Africa, excluding South Africa. And they've got like the engine brand and, and they produce, you know, oils and all sorts of stuff. And again, if Africa continues to grow and much of Africa outside of South Africa is growing really, really fast, what do people need? They need petrol, right? Um, and these guys are distributors of that. So you kind of want to see, at least I want to see something that over the next couple of years, this thing is going to continue to make money. There's no real threats to their business. They've got a big moat around them. And the only way that you find that out is you go and dig and see what's what's around there, right? Uh, and sometimes it's boring. A lot, of the, a lot of the time what I do is I use... Um, I use a bit of technology or whatever you want to call it, scanners. So I'll sort of scan out for stuff and say, okay, you know, this has relatively been the strongest or, um, you know, this thing is up 30% in one month. What is it? I've never even heard of it. Okay, let me go look. And then you dig, dig, dig. And, you know, sometimes it's a waste of your time. Uh, sometimes you find little gems, you know. I mean, Verimark a couple of years ago was a good trade. Um, it was basically, it had been the top performer for one month. VMK and I was like, I don't even know what VMK is. Then we go, oh, very much. Oh, I didn't even realize they were listed. Oh, okay, look, and you say, okay, well, there's been all this talk about um, delisting. You know, there's the the guy's been rumbling about it. The 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 owner's been rumbling about it for a while. And then you start thinking, okay, well, what is the company worth? So you look at the balance sheet and you look at what is the market capitalization, which is a simple calculation: outstanding shares or shares in issue versus price, or multiplied by price. Bang, this thing is undervalued by like, I think it was a couple of hundred million bucks, right? Or three or 400 million rand. It was a small company, right? So, okay, if they're going to, if they want to take it private and it's then surely they're going to have to buy out the shareholders at NAV. So we, we bought some, you know, and I, it's like a few months later, 30% higher bang, take out offer, you get uh, company gets delisted and you make 30% in your cash. And that was literally because of, um, you know, a scanning, like scanning software, like what were the best performers for the month? And then put something on my radar and then you go and dig into it and you go and read uh, years and years worth of financial data and, and trading updates and all sorts of stuff. And it is time consuming, but it really is the best way to, um, to understand the business, exactly what you said. How do they make money? What are their threats? What are their opportunities? What projects are they busy with? What's going right? What's going wrong? Uh, Sassel is a good example, you know, that Lake Charles project was the most exciting thing on earth until the wheels fell off um, and they've had to make drastic changes to the business. But now they're in a situation that they're looking really good and there's so much negative sentiment around the stock um, that it can't really catch a bird, right? It's just not managing to get any higher. Okay, it got above 220 yesterday, but um, you know, fundamentally, that thing is is presently undervalued. Um, 
what threats do they have to their business? Well, the major threat is Sasselberg um, and, the, and the Secunda plant. Those are big, big threats. That Secunda plant uh, especially is, pollutes like a monster. Um, and maintenance, I believe, has been a little um, not quite up to standard, if you will. So that is potentially a threat to them. I mean, that thing blows up, it's big problems. But, you know, if they can uh, address that relatively soon, it removes that threat and you've got a, a continued investment case. So I think something that we'll do is uh, actually, you know, we're going to do more of these, hopefully. And uh, then we'll, you know, you said you work with a spreadsheet and you can share that. I'm going to share some of my favorite tips. We're also going to get into the part two of this, where we're going to look at some of the charts. Uh, so stay tuned for that. I hope you have a, a great day and, and looking forward to part two. Thank you.